Hello, and welcome to the Malvern Panalytical Web Seminar Program. I am your host, Catherine Macchiarola, along with Edgar Chamorro behind the scenes. Today's webinar is entitled, The Science Behind Nanobubbles, How Nanobubbles Solve Tough Problems at Water Resource Recovery Facilities. This is a joint presentation between Moliere and Malvern Analytical. We'll have three presenters today. Our first speaker is Dr. Lorianne Parizo. Lorianne is passionate about science and environmental protection with extensive experience in wastewater treatment. She earned her master's in mechanical engineering for renewable energy from Sorbonne University in Paris, France. In the meantime, she worked as a business engineer for a gates and screening supplier, discovering a new interest in water treatment. Lorianne pursued her career with a PhD in the same university on cavitation bubbles and catalyst-based technologies to degrade organic molecules. She then moved to the U.S. and worked as project engineer at a wastewater treatment plant in Long Island, New York. Afterwards, she joined Caltech as postdoc research associate to characterize ozone bubbles in a packed column for toilet water treatment. As an R&D scientist at Moliere, Lorianne studies nanobubbles properties to develop new applications in water and wastewater treatment. Our next speaker is Dr. Ruggie Regev. Ruggie is an application scientist with Malvern Panalytical, specializing in a number of light scattering technologies and GPC SEC product lines. Ruggie received his PhD in macromolecular science and engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and completed his postdoctoral work in biomedical engineering at Yale University. His research focused on the fabrication and characterization of various synthetic polymer and metal-based nanoparticle systems for theranostic and drug delivery applications. And our final speaker is professional engineer, Andrea White. Andrea has a passion for the water environment and has dedicated her career to improving water quality using new and emerging technologies. She has broad-based knowledge of water and wastewater treatment, specializing in biological and chemical oxidation processes and gas to liquid transfer. In her current role, Andrea leads the water process engineering team at Moliere, where she focuses on developing and commercializing nanobubble applications for water treatment. So before we begin, I'd like to welcome you, our attendees, and explain some of the interactive features that we'll be using today. Please know that your questions are welcomed and encouraged. In order to ask your questions, just use the Ask the Speaker area on the right side of your screen. Simply type your question in and send it at any time. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, also, you can um, review the questions that have been submitted and actually vote on them. That will help us to prioritize the questions that we, we ask. Um, you'll also see a poll in your view. Um, this is a private poll. It's an easy way to indicate to us if you'd like more information about anything that you're hearing today. Um, and so we'd appreciate if you could take that poll at some moment. And then lastly, when you, when you um, before you leave, there is also a survey in that poll section, and this is how we make our program better. So we'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to take that survey. We are recording this, this web seminar, and it will be posted in our on-demand content area of our website located on the, under the webinars and events tab. If you're watching this on demand, you can send questions or comments to events at malvernpanalytical.com. Now I'm going to get our speakers on the line. Uh, hello, Lorianne. Andrea and Ruggie? Yeah, hello. 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 Hi, everyone. How's, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you. So, um, uh, Lorianne, could you give us a brief summary of what we'll see today? Sure. So, um, today we'll see how uh, we study nanobubbles to improve with water treatment first in the laboratory. Uh, uh, with the help of modern analytical equipment, and then in the field in a real wastewater treatment plants. All right, thank you. Um, so we are set to begin. Um, Lorraine, you can take it away. Yeah. So I can continue. Twenty-five percent and reduce energy usage by up to forty percent. In surface water, it could restore the aquatic ecosystem without any chemical addition, and it could increase also oil production up to 30%. But today, I will focus on wastewater application. And Raggy, you can go on the next slide. Uh, here is how we will proceed. I will present an introduction of uh, nanobubbles and surfactants, as this is a contaminant we decided to uh, study. 
and why surfactant removal is important in wastewater. Then I will present you the bench scale uh, study we've done with the help of uh, a nano site from Malvern Paralytical, and I will let Raggy present this equipment before uh, Andrea presents the field scale demonstration in a wastewater treatment plant. So next. So here is an introduction of nanoable and surfactant and why it's important in uh, wastewater treatment. You can go next. So nanoables are tiny gas bubbles uh, uh, of about 100 nanometers. So it's 2,500 smaller than a grain of uh, salt and they're uh, about the size of a virus. Those bubbles doesn't uh, um, rise and pop at the surface of the water. They stay in the water and have a Brownian motion, meaning that they uh, move in the water randomly. And some of their uh, properties that are interesting uh, for nanobubbles and their in inter interaction with surfactant is that they are polar and hydrophobic. So molecules as uh, surfactant are attracted to the bubble surface, as you can see on the uh, little graph on the right uh, slide. Uh, nanobubbles have many, many nice properties and they can enhance physical, chemical, and biological reaction in aqueous solution in general. You can go next so that you can, I can present you what are the surfactants. Surfactants are surface active agent. Uh, they are chemicals that can reduce the surface tension of the liquid. They have a hydrophobic, hydrophilic head that orients toward water and a hydrophobic tail that orients toward oil, air, contaminants, surfaces, or kind of molecules. Um, they are massively used uh, to clean in their household and also to improve some processes in the industry. So uh, surfactant end up in wastewater and in wastewater treatment plants. So it can disturb also some processes. So around nanobubbles, what's interesting is that nanobubbles are polar, as I said, and usually uh, charged negatively. So for example, for an ion anionic surfactant, the hydrophobic tail will be attracted by uh, the surface of the nanobubble but the uh, head that is anionic will be repulsed by the surface of the nanobubbles. While uh, in the case of a cationic surfactant, then both the tail and the head will be um, attracted by uh, the surface of the nanobubble. So it will uh, induce a very strong interaction between cationic surfactant and nanobubble. And these have been proved in many uh, literature paper, uh, literature review. So you can go next. Here is a zoom up of the uh, yeah, interaction. So in wastewater treatment plants, surfactant uh, can create foam and scum, and this is what can disturb uh, treatment processes. So before trying nanobubbles directly into the field, we needed to uh, study more deep all the interaction of uh, nanobubble and surfactant on a bench scale uh, size. And the result will then uh, comfort us to uh, try it on the full scale demonstration. So you can go next. So here is the bench scale surfactant removal study that have been done. You can go next. And first, before doing um, any kind of study, we needed to characterize the nanobubbles. And for that, we used um, Malvern Paralytical Nanosite 300. And how we do that, uh, we measure nanobubbles along the production of the nanobubbles so that we can observe a trend of uh, nanobubble production more than absolute numbers. And we really need to measure uh, the baseline of uh, nanoparticles so that every nanoparticles we can, that are accumulating along the uh, nanobubble production are considered as uh, nano, nanobubbles. And uh, I think now it's a good time for Raggy to present the nanosite and uh, his company. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lorianne. So let's just take a moment to pause and talk about nanosite and nanoparticle tracking analysis being the technique. So how does nanosite work? So nanosite will present many different parameters. It'll give you um, a size distribution for particles with a minimum size of 10 to 40 nanometers. The reason there's a range at the lower end has to do with the material type. If you're looking at nanobubbles, your lower range is going to be about 30 or 40 nanometers in diameter. If you happen to dose with metals or metal oxides, then you can push that lower limit to 10 nanometers because they have a higher scattering efficiency. The upper range would be about 2,000 nanometers or 2 microns, and that has to do with their size actually retarding the Brownian motion to a certain point. The next thing to understand and appreciate is that we can look at number or concentration of particles. The minimum number of part, uh, minimum concentration would be 10 to the sixth particles per mil um, to 10 to the tenth particles per mil. And most of the time with nanobubble generation, you can look, um, most stock concentrations I've seen have always been within these limits. And then you can understand and appreciate that you can look at high polydispersity high sam uh, samples with high polydispersity. You can look at very narrow distributions or broad distributions and, and look at a particle by particle distribution where it, that enables you to gate around a certain size ranges and understand what percentage of your nanobubbles or nanoparticles are within a certain size range. It'll give you the concentration of that range, that subpopulation and the constant and the size, uh, sorry, the percentage of that subpopulation as it relates to the total concentration. And finally, we can also look at relative light intensity. So if you have nanobubbles, but you're dosing them with metals and metal oxides, those might have a higher scattering efficiency than nanobubbles of the similar size. And so we, we can look at the relative light intensity to look at um, and do some reverse gaining to tease out subpopulations that way. And then lastly, we also have fluorescence. So if you do have fluorescent moieties in your solution, you can uh, look at a subpopulation that is fluorescently labeled by first picking the appropriate laser wavelength. We have the choice of violet 405, blue 48, green 532, and red 642 laser modules. And then they come with the corresponding long fast filter. So you'd insert the filter and then do the fluorescence analysis. The premise behind nanosite is that you first visualize and record a video or multiple videos of your particles moving around in Brownian motion. We're looking at the light scattered off the particles and not the particles directly. Then you would process that data where you can see here the each track is being, each particle is being tracked as it moves randomly in Brownian motion. You can see the red random walk of each particle. And then that translates to the size distribution and we'll talk about how we do that that's with the stokes einstein equation so <clears throat> the light scattered off the particles as i mentioned is seen not the particles directly and the speed varies with the size of the particles smaller particles will move faster than larger ones in random running motion and analysis all takes all of a few minutes so it's not something you have to set up and walk away and get data after an hour no, you can get data pretty quickly, all in, in the order of a few minutes. And the premise is that we're, what we're doing is we have a laser module with the laser uh, propagating through a prism that then scatters into a suspension of particles, and those particles then scatter light in themselves. And then we observe that light scattered with a high sensitivity camera, a Hamamatsu camera, a scientific CMOS camera, and a 20x objective lens. Then that enables us to um, track those particles on a particle by particle basis. And we have a good understanding of what the Z depth is um, from you know, mapping the, the, the volume and getting a, a good understanding of it. And so what we do is we translate the mean square displacement of those particles on a particle by particle basis to the hydrodynamic diameter, D sub H, with the Stokes-Einstein equation. And you can see that the variables that affect this relationship between the mean square displacement of those particles on a frame by frame basis to the hydrodynamic diameter are the temperature and the viscosity. And then we can look at the concentration because the camera will take uh, you know, several frames per second 
And what it'll do is actually look at the number of particles per frame. It extrapolates to a known third dimension and it calculates the concentration on a frame by frame basis. So after you record a video, you can get several frames or several averages of concentration, giving you an absolute number average of concentration in terms of particles per mil for a single video. And then fluorescence is the same process, but this time what you're doing is you're simply inserting a filter. And then you can look at a subpopulation that's fluorescent and compare it to the total population of particles. So you can see here that the image went away just for a minute, for a second, and now you're seeing the fluorescently labeled particles um, in the population. And the other thing to keep in mind is that in the case of nanobubbles, especially bubbles that are, let's say, ozone filled or other types of nanobubbles, they will scatter light quite efficiently. And so sometimes, even if you lower the camera level, you might get some flaring off the part, off the light scatter off the particles. So you can see that here in the left panel where the camera level is lower, but you still see this bright flaring off the particles. Well, the flaring might cause some undesired tracking by the software. And so what you do is that you would insert a neutral density filter. The neutral density filter would then mitigate that flaring and allow you to really put a crosshair on the center of the pixels of, of scattered light and track the particles more appropriately. So now with the neutral density filter, you're not getting these sort of quote unquote small particles, which really are flaring uh, present. And I wanna take a moment to introduce a new chapter in the NanoSight product line. Just last week, we had a global launch of a new version of NanoSight. It is now called the NanoSight Pro and no longer the NS300. And this comes with a whole series of improvements. You have more robust, modern, robust data. It's modern, easy to use, it's simple and accurate. We have more sensitive detection, especially for fluorescence. We have higher resolution for size and concentration. We have increased our temperature range up to 70 degrees Celsius as opposed to 50 or 55 degrees Celsius with the NS300. And we've removed human error and subjectivity. We've made this a whole lot more automated and the analysis is a lot, two or three times quicker than our current NS300. Um, and then we've in, in, employed some um, digital solutions with Malvern Analytical. It is a bit of a smaller system, so there's a smaller footprint for very crowded, busy labs. Um, and you see the Malvern Analytical branding now on the NanoSite Pro. Uh, we've made the laser modules more ergonomic with a handle that allows you to easily interchange between different laser modules to insert it and take it out. And it allows you to, the software will automatically recognize what laser module you have when you insert it. And then we've added some practicality to it with some little storage bins for the top plate and the screws that secure the top plate on top of the laser module by putting these little cubbies in front. We've made the software very accessible. It's a smart installation and it's easy to operate with a user-friendly interface with minimal setup and measurement. And again, it's two or three times quicker than before. And we also have made it more accurate, more precise. Um, you know, the alignment is very easy now with the laser module. You have greater detection and sensitivity. Um, you have precise uh, particle identification and tracking because we've now in, employed a machine learning or a neural network model of analysis, um, training the software over thousands and thousands of tracks and particle types. Um, and again, made it easy to clean and more efficient, um, giving you better statistics with better flow um, and making it really accessible to effectively remove any contaminants or impurities. Um, we've made it more sensitive for the dim or weakly scattering particles, such as biologics below 50 nanometers or nanobubbles, you know, down that range, and just improved identification and the tracking of the particles. And we've also, again, extended the temperature control from 55 degrees Celsius up to 70, um, 55 being the previous upper limit. 
to now the new upper limit being 70. And the lower limit for the NanoSight Pro for measurement is five degrees Celsius. So you can do stress study, studies and temperature ramp analysis and so forth. And then we have a dedicated fluorescence mode should you want to look at a subset of pot particles in your population that are fluorescently labeled. And it'll automatically calculate the labeling efficiency or the percent labeling of your particles. Um, we've added a guided workflow um, that allows you to really to understand the step-by-step -step measurement process um, and made things a lot more automated and, um, and you know, very logical in its layout. And the high resolution, because of the machine learning, the neural network learning, we've improved the resolution of, on a particle-by-particle -particle basis, um, whether you're looking at raw or what is called FTLA uh, analysis. And then on top of that, we've added a lot more feedback to enable you to have better confidence in what is truly um, good conditions in terms of the flow, the settings, the camera, the focus, um, and so forth. And then, also, and then also with the data quality for each measurement. So with that, I will hand um, the presentation off to Andrea, who will now continue. Oh, sorry, Lorianne, apologize. Thank you, Reggie. Reggie, it was very interesting. Can't wait to try this new equipment if we have the occasion. <laughs> Um, so now that you know uh, how the nanosite works, uh, I wanted to show you how it works for us in practice. So yeah, thank you, Reggie, to play against this video. This is a video of uh, nanoable in uh, DI water. Uh, you can press next, Reggie. So what you can see is that those nanoable are lower refractive index particles, meaning that they are refracting the light more directly and the size is consistently around 80 to 120 nanometer. Then you can watch at the second video where I use the same settings than uh, with the previous uh, video, but with surfactants. And what we can see is that the nanoparticles that you can see now are very shiner and it means that these coded nanoable are higher refractive index particles. And we also observe that the size tend to increase with those surfactants. And it revealed two uh, things that uh, nanoables and surfactants have indeed uh, a strong interaction and that the size increase because nanoables are surrounded by those surfactants. You can go next. I wanted to show you also an example of a report that the nanosites uh, give us um, because we, for a same samples, we set it up uh, so that he, you know, the nanosite can merge the, the same sample five times so that it's able to give us an average and a standard error. And this is how we collect the information of the concentration of the particles and also the size. Uh, out of uh, intensity screening. And again, we collect uh, several data points when we produce nanoable to observe a trend. And uh, we stop the experiment when we have a concentration uh, desirable for our experiment. And we always measure the background measurement as a baseline to really evaluate nanoable accumulation. You can go next. So let's go back to the surfactant that we actually used for our experiment. We used a cationic surfactant called benzalkonium chloride. This is a very common uh, quaternary ammonium compound used as a biocide, biocide sorry. And it's very representative of uh, what we can find uh, in uh, wastewater at the end. We measured this uh, benzalkonium chloride using a UVV spectrophotometer. And you can observe that there is a hydrophobic tail and a positive charge hydrophilic head. And this is why we choose it, because we think there would be a strong interaction with nanoable. You can go next. So let me explain you uh, the principle of the experiment. Uh, when nanoable are coated with surfactant, we need a little push to actually remove those uh, uh, nanoable coated with surfactant with uh, uh, physical force. And in this experiment, we use the air injection. 
which is also used in wastewater treatment uh, plant for various application. You can go next. So this is the apparatus that we use to inject uh, air saturated water. We have four jars so that we can play with the different uh, settings. And in those four jars, we actually introduced a different uh, volume of air in saturated water so that we can play with the ratio of uh, nanoable and surfactant water and uh, those air saturated water. If we inject more uh, saturated water, we can have a better uh, removal of surfactant up to a point because uh, if you add too much, you dilute too much the surfactant and then you add some dispersion effect. So you can go next so that I can show the results that we have got. So let me explain this graph. Uh, on the x-axis, you have this ratio of the volume of injected air saturated water per volume of surfactant nanobubble water. And we increased it to evaluate the fraction removed with nanobubble, the straight line, and without nanobubble, the dashed line. And on the y-axis, you can see the fraction removed over time. Reggie, you can go next to show the actual results because for a same point, for example, for a same ratio, uh, we obtain 59% uh, more of surfactant removal with the addition of nanoable. And for a same fraction removed, you can actually decrease of 53% the air saturated water injection, which means that on the field, you can actually uh, reduce the energy consumption, injecting um, air in your system to remove uh, your scum and surfactant. So it's actually a very good result and comfort us uh, that nanoable can have an impact in the actual wastewater treatment to remove surfactant. And I will let Andrea present those results. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, with the results that we saw in the lab, we were eager to see what would happen when we injected nanobubbles for pre-treating wastewater in the field. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you results from a case study at the Goleta Sanitation District uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility located in Central California. Next slide, please. Uh, so as we travel around to different wastewater treatment plants, especially over the last few years, we've come across a number of very common problems. Uh, problems associated with concerns around rising energy and chemical cost and consumption, concerns around fats, oils, grease, scum, and odors, frequent process upsets resulting in inconsistent treatment performance, also the presence of filamentous bacteria resulting in bulking, bulking sludge and problems and issues related to poor sludge settleability. All of these factors lead to concerns around treatment capacity constraints, facilities performing and behaving as if they're overloaded, even though they're being operated well below design loads. And then for systems that include anaerobic digesters, we see issues related to biogas production and biogas quality. Next slide, please. And what we have learned is that all these issues can be traced back to one common denominator, and that's the presence of surfactants, such as quaternary ammonium compounds. As Lorianne mentioned, these compounds are present in both municipal and industrial waste streams. They are also one of the main inhibitors and sources of inefficiency in wastewater treatment processes, especially the primary and secondary treatment processes, and the most sensitive bacteria, like the ones that perform nitrification and the ones that you will find in anaerobic digestion processes. Quaternary ammonium compounds, or QACs, and other surfactants contribute to the COD load to the plant, chemical oxidant demand. These materials are some readily biodegradable, but a majority of them are slowly biodegradable, meaning that they won't break down in your biological treatment process with the amount of time that that process has to break down those contaminants. In secondary treatment processes, these materials coat bubbles from the aeration system, reducing their oxygen transfer efficiency. 
They also coat the biomass and biological systems, reducing the transfer of oxygen into the biomass, uh, but also creating a toxic or inhibitory effect resulting in reduction in kinetics or treatment efficiency in biological processes. In physical separation processes, this presence of surfactants can emulsify wastewater, resulting in poor settleability and impeding the separation. This is for uh, systems such as clarifiers and dissolved air flotation units. They tend to accumulate in uh, the sludge, so they bind themselves to solids and biomass, and in doing so decrease the dewaterability of the sludge, creating issues with solids handling facilities. And probably most importantly is that they are only partially removed during secondary treatment, meaning that a portion of these materials pass on to either consume chemicals in chemical disinfection systems or disrupt advanced water treatment processes for water reuse and reclamation, or in systems that do not have a disinfection step, will pass on to the natural environment to consume oxygen in the receiving waters. Next slide, please. What we know now is that if you're able to remove surfactants from wastewater, you can enable treatment process intensification. Treatment process intensification basically means that you can treat more load using less infrastructure. And this is a result of the improvements that we see with better separation on physical separation processes, better oxygen transfer in biological systems, and the removal of the toxic and inhibitory effect that these contaminants have on biological systems. I like to use this diagram here to help explain it a little bit further. We all know that when you mix water and oil together, as you see at the bottom of the triangle, that these systems separate readily. As you start to introduce surfactants in combination with water and or in combination with oil, you start to create stable emulsions. And when the concentration of surfactants is high enough, you can actually form a gel-like substance that we typically in the industry refer to as surfactant or as we refer to as scum or fat birds or grease balls in scum traps, for example. So what is nanobubble pretreatment? Nanobubble pretreatment describes the injection of nanobubbles into raw screened wastewater to pretreat the wastewater upstream of a biological process. So specifically where the return activated sludge is introduced into the process. When primary clarifiers are present, we recommend injecting the nanobubbles upstream of the primary clarifier. Because getting the surfactants out of these waste streams uh, helps both the liquid and the sludge processes to perform more efficiently. This results in less energy, less chemicals, an increase in treatment capacity, smaller footprint to treat the same load, uh, better and more consistent effluent water quality, and overall improvements in process stability and reliability. As you can see here in the diagram, with the represented, represented by the dollar signs, the highest cost process at the wastewater treatment plant is typically the biological system. And the biological system requires a lot of oxygen to be transferred, which results in high power draw. So typically we see 50 to 80% of the energy required to treat wastewater uh, being consumed by the biological process. So improving the treatment efficiency of the process units upstream of the biological process, as well as the efficiency of the biological process, enables uh, a lot of operating costs to be saved. Next slide, please. And so the visible changes that we see here at some of the facilities that we've been installed at, on the left, you'll see an installation in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, there's a comparison of two side-by-side -side rectangular primary clarifiers. The one on the left is not receiving nanobubble pretreatment. The one on the right is receiving nanobubble pretreatment. Those two blue pipes are the suction and discharge lines from the nanobubble generator. Without nanobubble treatment, these primary clarifiers have a history of a five inch stable scum layer. The scum gets trapped and is not able to get out of the primary clarifier. This results in poor oxygen transfer at the surface of this basin, 
uh, impedes solid separation in the performance of the primary clarifier and also results in septic conditions that can cause odors. You can see that after a couple of weeks with nanobubble pretreatment, that stable scum layer, which is that gel-like layer that I was mentioning earlier, has been eradicated. On the right, from the case study that I'm about to share with you, you see the primary effluent equalization basin at the Gleta Sanitation District Wharf. Before nanobubbles were introduced to the system, they had stable foam at the surface of this basin, causing this basin to go have issues with odors. With nanobubble treatment, you see on the bottom, the eradication of the stable foam, providing better oxygen transfer at the surface and resolving the issues associated with odor. So in May of last year, we were contacted by the Goleta Sanitation District because they had a long history of issues that they knew were due to surfactants and quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, they came across an article in Treatment Plant Operator about some of the work that Lorianne was sharing and how nanobubbles can be used to remove surfactants from wastewater and decided that they wanted to pilot the technology. What you see here is the temporary installation. The system is now being converted to a permanent installation, which will be a submersible pump. Our technology requires pumped flow through the nanobubble generator that you see on the right-hand side and an air gas supply. In this case, we're using a six-inch nanobubble generator operated on plant air, and it's recirculating on a channel at the headworks, downstream of the screens and upstream of the primary clarifiers. The facility treats 4.2 million gallons per day average annual dry weather flow with a BOD on average of around 450 milligrams per liter. After nanobubble pretreatment, uh, the data shows that nanobubbles were able to reduce their blower power draw to their aeration system. They have turbo blowers on VFDs and DO control by 43%. Uh, this also improved the secondary effluent water quality, which enabled a 44% reduction in their chlorine demand or chlorine consumption at the chlorine contact basins. These benefits compound to also provide a 25% increase, increase in the biological treatment capacity of their trickling filter activated sludge system. We also measured 10% improvement in primary clarifier solids removal. Overall, they found that their treatment process was more stable and more reliable and their issues associated with process upsets were resolved, eliminating the need for bioaugmentation, which they were using to help the facility recover from the process upsets. Next slide, please. We wanted to dig into more, um, to get some more information on the types of surfactants that were present in Goleta's wastewater and also uh, how they compared to industry standard levels. We did a special sampling event where we measured surfactant concentrations and speciation. The total quaternary ammonium compounds represents the cationic surfactants. And we also measured for non-ionic and anionic surfactants. On the day that we measured, the total surfactants were close to 12 milligrams per liter. You see here on the bottom from uh, industry standard reference, uh, McGraw, Hill, Metcalf, and Eddy. 2007, that typical untreated wastewater surfactant levels are in the range of 4 to 10 milligrams per liter. I should note that this is from 2007 and a lot has changed since then with our wastewater. Our wastewaters are more concentrated now as a result of water scarcity and water conservation. Also, as a result of the pandemic and the change in human habits and moving from bar soaps to liquid detergents, we are all using a lot more surfactants. And so we're finding surfactant levels in wastewater that are much higher than the range shown here. The other three columns on this table just show that not all of the surfactants are removed by biological processes. As I mentioned, they tend to bind to the biomass and they go out with the sludge, um, the portion that doesn't bind to the biomass. If it's not readily biodegradable, it is in fact slowly biodegradable, passes on in your secondary effluent to consume disinfection chemicals or cause some of the other challenges that I mentioned. Next slide, please. So on the day that we measured the surfactants, 
We measured them across the primary clarifier to perform a mass balance to assess how much of the surfactants were actually being removed and to confirm that they weren't just coming out in the primary sludge. We also wanted to assess whether there was selectivity due to the surface charge of the nanobubble and the type of surfactant that was removed. What we learned is that there was not selectivity, that independent of the charge of the surfactant, we saw a 40 to 54% removal across the primary clarifier. And we also confirmed that these surfactants were in fact being removed from the wastewater and they weren't just accumulating with the solids and passing it through with the primary sludge. So just to recap, overall improvements that we've seen, and this is across multiple installations, um, primary clarifiers, we've seen up to a 10% improvement in solids removal. Um, in fact, for Valida, it went from 69% to 79%. So this was already a well-performing primary clarifier uh, that we saw the 10% improvement on. Uh, for aeration energy, we've seen a 43% reduction in the power draw required by the blowers to provide the same level of dissolved oxygen due to the improvements in oxygen transfer efficiency. Um, and this is both to the bulk liquid as well as to the biomass. And these improvements resulted in a 25% increase in treatment capacity. At another facility that was suffering from quaternary ammonium compound inhibition to their anaerobic digesters, pre-treating the sludge stream to the anaerobic digesters increased their biogas production by 98%. And then for disinfection, removing these materials from the secondary effluent results in a significant decrease in chlorine demand or chlorine consumption. That clean sanitation district, we measured that at 44%. So at this point, I'd like to pass it back over to Ruggie to give you guys some more information about where you can find more information on what we shared with you today, as well as how to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So yeah, we hope that you found this presentation really helpful. Um, we want to leave you with some resources that um, where you can learn more about both Moliere's products and Malvern Paleticals products. So Moliere has a number of resources, as you see here, where we have um, a hyperlink for a resource center where you can look at third-party scientific articles, eBooks, and more. There's case studies to see the benefits of nanobubbles in multiple industries. Um, a blog about how you can learn about nanobubbles in, in depth with Moliere's blogs. Um, you can contact them um, to talk with an industry expert in your area, and you can email them to get directly connected to Moliere. With Malvern Panalytical, we have a knowledge center where you can look at um, a number of you know uh, resource types. We have a brochure for the Nanosite NS300. One for the Nanosite Pro is coming very soon. And then we have a white paper that discusses the characterization of nanobubbles and ultrafine bubbles by nanoparticle tracking analysis, and another application note that further discusses nanobubble applications and characterizations by nanoparticle tracking analysis. We do have the Zeta Sizer Advanced Series. I did see just a question right now about the use of Zeta potential. Um, for this particular uh, presentation, we did focus on nanosite and nanoparticle tracking analysis. But if you'd like to learn more about um, how Zeta Potential is used for a nanobubble characterization, please look at one of our previous webinars um, in this series with Moliere. And then we have finally a blog <coughs> um, that's entitled, Those Bubbles Are Ultra Fine. A little play on words. Um, you can request a quote if you're interested in getting a nanosite system. You can request a demo. We do travel and, you know, to far and wide um, uh, to come on site and do demonstrations, analyze a few of your samples and create a report and discuss it with you. And then any other sales questions, please feel free to use that link to contact our sales department. So um, I do also wanna mention that we do, that there is the ISO TC281 fine, um, ultra fine uh, committee, uh, fine bubble committee um, that is 10 years old, um, has published 18 standards, um, 14 standards are currently under development, and it provides guidance on the generation and usage of fine and ultra fine bubbles, um, including characterization guidance and uh, many, many other um, aspects. 
Um, so, you know, new countries and experts are welcome to join the ISO meetings. There are two meetings per year and they help develop these standards. And so with that, I'll leave you with um, our contact information. Um, again, my name is Raghu Ragim. Um, you can see my email below there. And we have had uh, Lorianne Perezo and Andrea White, who have also um, been kind to join us and present with us. And you can see their, um, their email addresses there as well. And from there, I'm happy to take any questions along with Lorianne and Andrea. Um, and I know we've had some people in the in the chat um, answering questions as we go along, but I'm happy to, uh, you know, we, we're happy to address any other questions that remain right here. Great, yeah, I, I do see questions coming in. Um, they're coming in under the poll, so I'll have to jump back and forth between the poll and the questions. Uh, this question is for um, Moliere. Um, people, how is foaming property of different surfactants in presence of different nanobubbles? I can speak to what we've observed in the field. Um, you know, wastewater has many different types of surfactants combined in it, so we can't speak to individual types of surfactants. But what we do see is the eradication of stable foam. Uh, so we do know that there is an interaction with the nanobubbles that prevents the foaming from the surfactants and is degrading or removing the surfactants from the waste stream. Okay. And then a quick question. Do you operate in the UK? We do. Uh, as do Malvin Panalytical. Uh, another question. Is there any specific reason why nanobubbles are not added in the secondary treatment? Yes. So that's actually where we started injecting nanobubbles. And what we learned is that the concentration of nanobubbles that need to be injected is much higher when we're injecting into the biological process, uh, at least at a point after where the return activated sludge is introduced. And the reason why is because surfactants want to bind with the surface of the biomass and we want them to interact with the nanobubbles. So we inject upstream of the biological process so that we can provide a smaller nanobubble generator to the deliver the level of pretreatment required. Okay. Um, a uh, philosophical question. How do you see this playing a role in the larger decarbonization and ESG strategies? Uh, this person has, has their ideas, but would like to hear from this group. Yeah, so this is very promising, uh, you know, at a high level, it's very promising because I could see that nanobubble pretreatment can be used to help facilities approach uh, neutrality in their energy use, uh, both by improving anaerobic digester performance so that for facilities with cogen, they can recover more energy, uh, and then also in Pre-treating the wastewaters, uh, the further you go upstream, ideally eventually getting into the collection system, you can actually keep uh, solids from solubilizing. Uh, the solubilized materials or contaminants are what require the most energy because those are what are removed by the secondary treatment process. So if we're able to utilize nanobubble pre-treatment all the way up into the residential and commercial users, then there is great promise for keeping materials solid through the collection system and then being able to use um, lower, more efficient technologies like uh, primary clarifiers and separation, physical separation processes to remove those materials and then get them onto anaerobic digestion before they've had a chance to solubilize. Okay. Uh, if nanobubbles are so effective, why are they not more widely used? Can nanobubbles be naturally formed? If somebody else wants to jump in, feel free, Lorianne, but I can yeah, answer sure. this one as well. Uh, they actually are natural in that uh, they were first identified in crashing waves. Uh, the reason why we have not been using them is because until recently, we didn't have uh, the analytical instruments or the methods to produce, uh, to measure nanobubbles, let alone produce them at the scale required to treat wastewater. Uh, so Moliere has the patent on the method for producing nanobubbles known as the shear method. 
uh, and fortunate for us that shear method scales very well uh, hydraulically. So we're able to introduce in continuous uh, injection nanobubbles into waste streams, whereas a lot of other methods uh, require batch processes. Yeah, I would add also that uh, nanobubbles have been proven to be existent only 20 years ago. So it's a pretty new um, uh, phenomenon uh, for us to study and uh, be able to implement it uh, at full scale. As Andrea said, uh, we as Moliere are able to produce full scale equipment while usually this is more like lab scale nanobubble production that is uh, typically uh, used. Yeah, it seems the applications for nanobubbles are just growing astronomically. And this is, this is only one application of many. Uh, can you please tell more about the end products of surfactants removal, destruction by nanobubbles? What remains from surfactant after nanobubbles treatment? And that is a great question. So both the mechanisms of actions and uh, the actual degradation and what byproducts may still be present is something that we are actively researching. Uh, what we have seen in the field from our field data and using COD fractionation data uh, is that there is a portion of these materials that are being completely removed. So going all the way to CO2 and water. However, there's also a portion of these materials that are being converted from slowly biodegradable to readily biodegradable COD, uh, making them easier to remove from the wastewater by biological processes, but also indicating that not all of the reactions go to completion when nanobubbles are interacting with surfactants. Okay. Um, how are nanobubbles generated? Were there the issue of quick temperature rise? I, I believe that that issue, and, and Lorianne would know best about this one, is, is mostly around when they're talking about cavitation nanobubbles. Um, these nanobubbles that we generate using Moliere's technology are generated by manipulating the hydraulic properties of both the, the water or the liquid, wastewater in this case, uh, and the gas supply. And so we know that maintaining um, certain gas flows and pressures and certain water flows and pressures um, across an operating range provides uh, nanobubble production rates in a range that we can use for wastewater pretreatment. And how do nanobubbles affect foam fractionation? It's a good question. For you, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's just yeah. something we are trying to discover also in the lab at uh, Moliere. Try to. Uh, um... It looks like we lost Lorianne. I can jump in. Uh, so this is something we're also actively we're actively studying and analyzing at the lab scale. So we do know that um, different materials foam for different reasons, and so we are analyzing the role of nanobubbles in foam fractionation processes. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Um, well, someone is asking the, 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 the big question, um, providing a range minimum size and price to the largest project size and price, like how much does it cost to get into nanobubbles? So on the scale of treating wastewater at municipal facilities, uh, we are typically looking at what we refer to as a nanobubbles as a service contract. This is a form of institute situ chemistry. So we're generating a form of chemistry using water and air on site. And so with that um, comes a, a service contract to uh, replace the nanobubble generator with new and improved technologies, for example, uh, but also gives us the flexibility to dial in on the dose of nanobubbles required to treat a given waste stream. A smaller nanobubble generator system, one that might be used on a dissolved air flotation system, for example, uh, would likely be a sale. So depending on what process type and whether it's a, a large plant or a small plant, uh, there's a full range of prices uh, that I can connect you with somebody, one of our business development managers could help you uh, get specific pricing for the application that you have in mind. 
Yeah, if you go back to the poll, you can right there would be a very quick way to say you're interested to learn more about um, Moliere nano bubble generators. Uh, how long do nano bubbles stay active? Are they more effective with hydrogen? I guess hydrogen would depend uh, on the reaction you want to have, and uh, they stay. I would say they stay in water. As I'm. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, you are. Um, I, I, I was saying that uh, nanobubbles are staying in water as long as they are not disturbed because they can be disturbed and, and collapse. And this is how you can expect to see more results. And as for hydrogen, I guess it depends on the reaction you want to have. To have. It really depends on the, the type of reaction you, you, you want to create. Like it can be ozone nanobubbles, it can be oxygen nanobubble, nitrogen, and it really depends on what you want to do. Okay. Um, were you able to achieve repeatability when measuring the nanobubble concentration and size? And may you comment on the nanobubble stability? So I would say in the lab, this is easier than uh, in the field. Um, in the field, you have a lot of uh, nanoparticles that are disturbing the measurement with the nanosites. So this is a method that, uh, again, we need to improve and uh, we are working on it. Okay. Does temperature increase due to bubble generator effect, bubble size and concentration? So the temperature increase that we observe is related to the pump motor. So heat loss from the pump motor will increase the temperature, but it's nominal um, for most systems. I think we've um, come to the end of our time for this webinar. Um, great questions from the audience. If we didn't get to your question quite yet, we will get to it offline. Uh, thank you for participating in this. Um, so this concludes our today's web seminar. Thank you for attending and please take a moment to click on our survey before you exit. It's also under the poll section. Um, this is how we improve our program. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ruggy to add any final comments. Yeah, thank you again, Kathy, and thank you, Andrea and Lorianne, and everyone else at Moliere for collaborating with us on this these series of webinars about nanobubbles. You know, Moliere and Nanosite uh, and, and Malvern Palytical have a lot of great products to offer in unison when it comes to the formation and characterization of nanobubbles. And we'd love to hear from you more um, with your questions and your needs and um, an opportunity to address those needs. So thank you again for your time and we uh, have a good rest of your day. Yes, thank you and goodbye.